Kids, you guys can go to Kids on the Rock this morning. I'm going to tell you what. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Make sure my mic's working. Thank you guys for letting me go back to Tennessee over the last week. Um, I'm thankful to have a man like Cameron to step in and to fill the pulpit. Um, I listened to his sermon. Don't think I didn't. And it was excellent. It was the Word of God. It was, I mean, it's just what the church needed to hear. And I also want to say before we begin, of course, if you have your Bibles, you can turn to Acts chapter 23. We're going to continue our exposition of Acts. I also want to say that um, being back in Tennessee, I got the chance to go, you know, to a, another church on Sunday morning, Christmas morning, and uh, I miss you guys. <laughs> we, we are definitely blessed. We are blessed with each other, and I am thankful to be here at First Baptist Church in Mulvane. Today is, uh, of course, the first day of the new year, um, and boy, are we not looking forward to what God has in store for us uh, in 2023. As we, um, well, I guess as, as we look back at 2022 and the last year, man, we can see God's hand just in so much going on here at First Baptist Church. Not the least of which is, of course, we've seen God provide for the building project that He's called us to undertake. And uh, I am, man, I'm so thankful that He is using you, using us, uh, to, to accomplish His will through this. And I'm also thankful for the growth that we've seen at First Baptist Church and the discipleship that we're seeing. Uh, man, God is just good to us, is He not? He is able to do more than we could ever ask, more than we could ever think. Our God is in control. He is moving and working to accomplish His will. So as we enter into the new year, as we begin this, the first day of the new year, I want to come as we continue our exposition of Acts. We're going back into Acts. If you're visiting here, we've been walking through the book of Acts for a long, long time. We're almost done. Um... We can enter this new year, we can rest in His care. If our God is for us, as we just sang, as it says in Romans 8, who, who can be against us? We can rest in His care. And that's true no matter what happens. Even if, even if things aren't going so great in our esteem, even if there's difficulties and hardships and trials that await us, we know that suffering is always going to accompany this life. So even when things aren't as, as wonderful as they may be right now, maybe you're going through hardships right now in your, in your life. Maybe there are things that are going, going on in your life and you don't understand why and you don't understand where God's hand is in all of this. Even in those times, we can rest in His care. As we've walked through the book of Acts, we've seen God move just in miraculous ways all over the place. We've seen Him rescue Peter from prison through the appearance of an angel that just led him out of prison. We've seen God rescue Paul and Silas from prison with an earthquake and just these miraculous displays of God. And all through the Scriptures, we see that our God knows how to deliver His people. But let's be honest, there are times when we don't see His miraculous hand moving. We don't know what He's doing through this circumstance or that trial. There are times when we feel like, is God silent for a reason? Have I done something wrong? When trials and hardships and sufferings abound, sometimes it's hard to see God's care and to rest in that care. Especially when we feel like things are spiraling out of control. Our text today, in Acts chapter 23, verses 12 through 35, we're going to finish this chapter today, it, it instructs us in those times. It shows us that, that even when you can't see it, when you don't know why things are happening the way they are, God is in control. And He has a plan, He has a purpose. Most of the time in our lives, God, and most of the time in the lives uh, uh, of the biblical patriarchs and the people that we see in Scripture, most of the time, God is not working through miraculous intervention and earthquakes and lightning flashes and fire from heaven. Most of the time, God works through what we call providence. 
Providence is simply defined as God accomplishing His will through the normal everyday events and decisions of this life. It's God working all things according to the counsel of His will, as it says in Ephesians chapter 1. Providence in our lives, God's working, is often unseen and unnoticed by us as we're, as we're living out our lives. But all of us, I think, if you've, if you've walked with the Lord any amount of time at all, you can look back on past events of your life, even if they're bad, even if they were suffering and trials, and you can look back and you can say, I can see God's hand in that. I can see what God was doing there through all this. I can see how He was fulfilling His will, His plan, His purposes. What we learn from Acts 23, verses 12 through 15, is that God is faithful to His work. And we can rest in His power, in His providence, in His working through the everyday mundane events of this life. When we left Paul, it's been several weeks since we were in Acts over Christmas. When we left Paul, remember he had been beaten and mobbed by the Jews in the temple court. Then he was arrested by the Roman garrison in Jerusalem, and the Romans were about to scourge him, to beat him, to flog him, to find out what was going on in this crowd when he revealed to them that he was a Roman citizen. And then all things stopped. It was illegal to arrest a Roman citizen without formal charges, so the tribune, the commander of the Roman garrison, took Paul before the Sanhedrin, the ruling council of the Jews, just to figure out what the charges were. What's this guy accused of? Why is this riot happening? But as Paul tried to make his case to the Sanhedrin, to the ruling council of the Jews, we saw that even they became a violent mob. And fearing for his life, the Roman tribune grabbed Paul and took him out of there. So as we come to this text, beginning in verse 12 of chapter 23, things are not going well for Paul. They're not going how he would have hoped they would have gone. Every time he tries to be a witness, every time he tries to testify to Jesus Christ before whatever crowd he's before, it turns into chaos. It turns into violence. You can only imagine how Paul is feeling. But in verse 11, which was the last verse we read when we were in Acts 23, Jesus appears to Paul in his cell. And he says this, The following night the Lord stood by him, Paul, and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. Jesus comes to Paul and he tells him, Keep up your courage. Take courage. Don't be afraid. Things are going according to plan. Paul, you're going to Rome and you're going to testify to my name there just as you have testified in Jerusalem. But notice in that verse, in verse 11, Jesus doesn't tell Paul how this is going to happen. He just tells him that it is going to happen. And what we're going to see in verses 12 through 35 is today we're going to see how God begins to accomplish this sending of Paul to Rome. It's not by a miraculous display of supernatural power or deliverance. It's by simple providence, by God working through the situations, the circumstances, the events, and the decisions of the people around Paul. So as we begin, what we're going to do is we're just going to read verse 12 through 24, and then we'll stop there and read the rest as we get to it. Sound good to you? Okay, good, because that's what we're going to do anyway. That clock... That clock on the back of the wall is stopped, so if I go over, I'm sorry, it's not my fault. (laughs) Verse 12 says this, Jesus has just appeared to Paul, take courage, you're going to Rome. Verse 12, when it was day, the Jews made a plot and bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they had killed Paul. There were more than 40 who made this conspiracy. They went to the chief priests and elders and said, We have strictly bound ourselves by an oath to taste no food till we have killed Paul. Now therefore you, they're talking to the chief priests, along with the council, give notice to the tribune to bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly and we are ready to kill him before he comes near. Now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush. 
So he went and entered the barracks and told, told Paul. Paul called one of the centurions and said, Take this young man to the tribune, for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune, the Roman commander, and said, Paul the prisoner called me, this is a centurion talking, and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. The tribune took him by the hand. That's why a lot of people think this was a boy, the nephew took him by the hand and was going aside and, and going aside asked him privately what is this that you have to tell me and he said the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though they were going to inquire somewhat more closely about him but do not be persuaded by them for more than 40 of their men are lying in ambush for him who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat nor drink till they have killed him and now they're ready waiting for your consent so the tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, Tell no one that you have informed me of these things. Then he called two of the centurions and said, Get ready 200 soldiers with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night, which was 9 o'clock. Also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix, the governor. Let's stop there and we'll begin with the rest of it when we get to it. Let's pray together. Father, we do love you and we thank you for your word. God, I pray that you would just give us clear hearts and minds, that you would give me uh, clarity to explain your word. God, I pray that you would speak. We're not here to hear me. We're here to hear you. So God, I pray that you would speak to our hearts and that you would tell us what you would have us to know. We do thank you. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen. The first thing that you see in this text is really there's, there's no exposition of biblical doctrine here. There's no commands. There's no exhortations. But the first thing that you see is that God uses the schemes of the enemy. God is working to fulfill His promise to Paul. Paul, you are going to Rome. Don't worry. Take courage, he says. You're going to Rome. And the first thing you see, in the night Jesus appears and He assures Paul that you're going to Rome, and the very next morning in verse 12, it says that a large group of Jews were plotting to kill Him. They're determined to keep God's promise from happening. They don't know about the promise that He's going to Rome, but they're just going to kill Him. They want to stop Him from breathing, much less go to Rome. And they're determined to do it quickly. It says that they, they take an oath, they vow not to eat or drink until Paul is dead. These guys are deadly serious about killing him. They had to know, they had to know that even if they succeed, even if they, everything goes just like they want and they end up killing Paul, the Romans are going to kill them. Paul is a Roman citizen. So as soon as the Lord promises you're going to Rome, the very next morning, you have over 40 people dead set on keeping that from happening. And not only do you have these 40 or so zealots, they also enlist the help of the Jewish leaders. Verse 14 and 15 says, These 40 guys went to the chief priests and elders. This is the ruling council of the Jews. These are the guys that are supposed to be devoted to God's law, administering priests of Israel. They go to them and they said, Listen, we bound ourselves by an oath to not eat or drink till we kill Paul. Now therefore you, along with the council, give notice to the tribune and bring him down to you as though you were going to determine his case more exactly and we're ready to kill him before he comes near. They know, these 40 guys know that they can't attack the whole Roman garrison, so they bring their plan to the chief priest. The idea was that the priest would ask to examine Paul again, just like they did before, and the Roman tribune would potentially walk Paul out across the temple court, and you know, even if there were a few soldiers with him, 40 armed guys could get the job done. So what you have here is just wickedness on display. It's, it's kind of ironic to me that they just went to the priest thinking, yeah, they'll help us kill this guy. Wickedness on display. There are a host of people, including the leaders, willing to break God's commands, willing to lie, willing to murder, willing to risk the wrath of Rome, their own lives, just to silence the gospel that Paul is preaching. That really shouldn't be surprising to us, you know? The Gospels always had enemies seeking to stamp it out, and it always will in this fallen world. But even as these men and, and the authorities and the chief priests, they plot to derail God's promise, their plot, their scheme, is what God uses to bring His promise to pass. 
We saw what happens. The tribune's going to dispatch all these soldiers because of this plot. It's this plot, this conspiracy that God ultimately uses to get Paul out of Jerusalem and to do so under the protection of the Roman army. It's because of the conspiracy that the tribune sends Paul out with a military escort. They're trying to silence Paul's witness, but God uses their wickedness, their evil scheme to protect Paul. Not only protect him, but when he sends Paul off, he's going to magnify Paul's witness to kings, to Felix, to Agrippa, to all of these kings, and all the way to Rome. This plot is used by God to magnify Paul's witness to the world. That reminds me of a story way back in Genesis. Joseph's brothers hated him, beat him, sold him into slavery, threw him in a pit and then sold him into slavery, seeking to do away with him, evil in their hearts, evil in their intent. And throughout Genesis, after God uses Joseph to save Egypt and to save Israel from the famine, at the end of the book, when they're confronted with their sin, with their wicked scheme, Joseph can look them in the eyes and say, you meant this for evil. God meant it for good to save many people alive. Listen, we can rest in the fact that our God is in control even when the enemy conspires to destroy us. No weapon formed against us will come against us and prosper. All things work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to His purpose. If God be for us, as we sang, who can be against us? God knows how to rescue His people. But to rescue Paul here, God doesn't use a whirlwind. He doesn't use an earthquake. He doesn't use fire from heaven. As He so often does, He uses the small, tiny, and unexpected things. Things that you would have never imagined. Our God works in in unexpected ways. Let's start with verse 16. It says, now the son of Paul's sister heard of their ambush, so he went and entered the barracks and told Paul. This verse, verse 16 here, tells us everything that the New Testament has to say about Paul's family. That's it. And Luke doesn't answer any of the questions that we're all asking right now. The questions we wished he would ask or answer. Like, who is this guy? Who is this nephew? How old is he? What's his story? Why is he in Jerusalem? How does he hear about this plot? How does he come by the information that he has? We aren't given any answers to any of those questions. All we can do is guess and speculate. But I think that's Luke's point. He presents this nephew, son of Paul's sister, who we don't know anything about, as being just the right person at the right place at the right time. It just so happened that Paul's relative was there and it just so happened that he was able to overhear about this ambush or this plot. What a coincidence, don't you think? How lucky for Paul. Well, in in reality, it's not luck and it's not coincidence. Jesus told Paul that he would testify in Rome, that he would go to Rome, and this is how it's going to come about through a boy. We think it's a boy because the tribune took him by the hand, This boy who just happened to be in the right place at the right time. You see, our God is in control. Over the smallest details of everyday life. Think about how many decisions, how many circumstances, how many events had to have happened for this nephew to be in the right place at the right time. The the decision of his family to send him to Jerusalem. His decision to go where they were meeting that day and not go somewhere else. Whether to turn left or to turn right on this street or that street. Just to be right there at the right moment at the right time. Everything working together so that he would be right where God wanted him to be to fulfill the promise that he gave to Paul. We can all look back in times in our lives and just... See God's hand. This happened to be in the right place at the right time, at the right, at the right season. I can look back in my life and I can see God's hand in how I met my wife, 
when I was a kid, my family had a decision to make, whether we're going to move to West Tennessee or whether we're going to move somewhere else. And I remember them struggling over this decision and debating this decision. If we would have moved somewhere else, I would have never have met her, never have had my children. But God was in that. I can see God's hand in how I was called to ministry. Even how I came to First Baptist Church. Someone on the search committee told me that the only reason I was first considered was because I knew how to play the guitar. That's not the reason why I'm here, but that was the reason why I was first considered. It's an act of God that I was even considered for this position. But all things work together according to His purposes. That means that we can rest in the fact that our God is in control. But I want you to make sure that you notice this. Trusting God's providential hand doesn't mean that you just lay back and do nothing as if we're not responsible for our actions. Look at verse 17. It says, Paul called one of the centurions and said, take this young man to the tribune for he has something to tell him. So he took him and brought him to the tribune and said, Paul the prisoner called me and asked me to bring this young man to you as he has something to say to you. Paul doesn't say to his nephew, well, thanks for the information, but God promised me I'd go to Rome, so I'm pretty safe. I'm just going to lay back and relax and wait for God to save me. No, Paul sends his nephew to the tribune. Paul sends him and says, listen, you need to go tell this information to them authorities because I'm a prisoner. I can't do anything. You need to go take this information and bring it to them. Paul acts when the situation presents itself. Listen, if a storm's coming, trusting God doesn't mean that you don't prepare. That you don't make preparations. No, in fact, it's just the opposite. Trusting God and His providence means that as events are set before us, we act with responsibility, with biblical wisdom, and we trust that God is guiding our path and all things are under His control. There's an old joke I've debated about telling it because I know everybody in here has heard it before, but I'm going to tell it anyway. It's a joke about the guy in the flood and... and, and Everybody's heard it, but I don't care. I'm going to tell it anyway. <laughs> the guy's storm's raining and he's flooding and he's standing on his porch and the water's up there and a boat comes by and says, hey, get in, we're going to save you. He says, oh, don't worry about me. God's got me. He's going to take care of me. So they leave. And then the water's a little bit higher. He's on the edge of his roof and another boat comes by. Come on, get in. Oh, don't worry about me. I'm, I'm a believer. God's got me. He's going to save me. Don't worry. Just go help somebody else. And then finally he's standing on his chimney and the water is right to his chin. A helicopter comes by with a ladder and says, get on the ladder. He says, no, don't worry about me. God's going to take care of me. And then he drowns. He goes to heaven. He says, God, what happened? He said, man, I sent two boats and a helicopter for you. <laughs> Trusting God's providence doesn't mean we don't act. Doesn't mean we just lay back. It means that we act while we trust that our God is in control of all things. That's what Paul does here. Look at what the tribune does. The tribune took him by the hand, took the nephew by the hand, and going aside, asked him privately, what is this that you have to tell me? And he said, the Jews have agreed to ask you to bring Paul down to the council tomorrow as though we're going to inquire somewhat more closely about him. And he gives him counsel. This little boy, I think it was a boy because he took him by the hand, this little nephew gives the Roman tribune, the Roman commander, counsel, do not be persuaded by them, for more than 40 of the men are lying in ambush for him who have bound themselves by an oath neither to eat or drink till they have killed him, and now they're ready waiting for your consent. And look what the tribune does. The tribune dismissed the young man, charging him, tell no one of what you've informed me of these things. And then he called two of the centurions, two of the, the, the lower officers, and he said, get... Get ready 200 soldiers, heavy infantry, with 70 horsemen and 200 spearmen to go as far as Caesarea at the third hour of the night and also provide mounts for Paul to ride and bring him safely to Felix the governor. The tribune recognizes the seriousness of this plot and he responds accordingly. He musters heavy infantry and cavalry about half the total garrison of Jerusalem to get Paul out of the city at night. There are 40 people plotting his death, so we're going to send 470 soldiers out to protect him. Now these soldiers, they just thought they were transporting a prisoner. But God was protecting his witness. 
He was moving him a step closer to Rome, fulfilling the promise that he had given to Paul in verse 11. And I want you to see this. Nobody could have predicted how the Romans would have responded to the the hearing of this plot against Paul. No one could have predicted what the tribune's reaction was going to be or if sending Paul to Felix would even help or even solve this. No one could have predicted that this is how God would fulfill His Word. And so the question we might ask is, why does God do it this way? I'm going to give you a real deep theological answer. You ready? I don't know. (laughs) God's ways are higher than our own. He uses the most unexpected things, the most... The most unimaginable things, the tiny, small, little things for His purposes, for His glory. He uses this nephew. He uses the decision of the tribune. He uses the might of the Roman army. He uses everything to fulfill His plan and purpose. And since that is true, we know that we can trust His will. He's in control. And we also need to see that these Roman soldiers, the Tribune and Felix and all these guys, they're not the heroes of this story. Because the fact is that God also works through man's selfish intentions. We haven't read this part, but we're going to read it in just a second. But we saw in verse 23 and 24 that the Tribune says, okay, we're going to send 470 soldiers with him to protect him. What do you think the motivation of the tribune was? Do you think he cared about Paul, the preacher? Do you think he cared about doing what was right or justice or any of that? Not at all. He sees this as an opportunity to get this whole problem out of his lap. From the moment that he realized Paul was a Roman citizen, he hasn't handled this very well. And his life is on the line. Because he arrested and almost flogged a Roman citizen. And now all of Jerusalem wants this guy dead because of some religious view that he doesn't even understand. He's in a tough spot. So hearing about this conspiracy to kill Paul, he sees it as an opportunity to get this problem out of his lap and to save his hide. How do I know that? Because we see his motivation in the letter that he sends to Felix with Paul. In verse 25, it says, And he wrote a letter to this effect. He's sending Paul with all these soldiers, and he wrote this letter. Claudius Lysias, that's his name, to to His Excellency the Governor Felix, greetings. This man was seized by the Jews and was about to be killed by them when I came upon them with the soldiers and rescued him, having learned that he was a Roman citizen. There are more lies in that sentence than there are words. First, we learn that his name is Claudius Lysias. We haven't known that until now. But we also see old Claudius is very careful how he arranges the facts, isn't he? He leaves out how he put Paul in chains illegally. He leaves out how he almost scourged him illegally. And he makes it sound like he came and rescued Paul from the Jews after learning that he was a Roman citizen. Like he swooped in to protect this Roman. But none of that's true. He didn't find out Paul was a citizen until after he had arrested him and when he was about to beat him. And of course, you know why he's so careful with his explanation to Felix, don't you? He's trying to save his own skin. He doesn't want, number one, he doesn't want a Roman citizen killed on his watch in Jerusalem. But also, he doesn't want his mishandling of Paul to come to light. That's his motivation. That's why he decides to send all these soldiers to protect Paul That's why he's sending him to Felix. He's doing so because it's going to benefit him. It's going to get all of this problem that's been going on the last two days out of his lap. Send it to Felix and I'm going to send the guys that accused him to you too. You handle it. Now the Tribune does say one thing that's true. In verse 28 he says, "...and desiring to know the charge..." for which they were accusing him, I brought him down to their council. I found that he was being accused about questions of their law, but charged with nothing deserving death or imprisonment. And when it was disclosed to me that there would be a plot against the man, I sent him to you at once, ordering his accusers also to state before you what they have against him. Basically, he says, as far as I can find out, Paul's not guilty of any crime. And he should be set free. He says, he's not deserving of death or imprisonment. But I'm sending everybody just to you, Felix. You hear them out. 
So the tribune sends Paul to Felix, not because he wants to do what is right or he's just. He's trying to protect himself from trouble and wash his hands of this whole thing. Now look how this section ends as we come to the end. Verse 31 through 35. So the soldiers, according to their instructions, because they're doing what they're told, they took Paul and brought him by night to Antipatris. And on the next day, they returned to the barracks, letting the horsemen go on with him. When they had come to Caesarea and delivered the letter to the governor, they presented Paul also before him. On reading the letter, he asked what province he was from. And when he learned that he was from Cilicia, he said... I will give you a hearing when your accusers arrive. And he commanded him to be guarded in Herod's praetorium, the governor's house that Herod had built. So first they arrive at Antipatris, which is just a little small military station on the border between Judea and Samaria, about half the distance to Caesarea. And now that most of the danger is out of the way, they think most of the soldiers head back and the cavalry goes on, brings him to Caesarea, and they bring him to Felix, and Felix agrees to hear this case. Felix became the governor around 52 A.D., uh, and he was stripped of his governorship around 59 or 60 A.D. He was a ruthless, corrupt, and incompetent leader. The only reason that he was given the governorship at all was because his brother named Pallas was friend of the emperor. So the question really is, why does Felix decide to take Paul's case and not send him to Cilicia, which was another province, which was where Paul was from? Was it because Felix wanted justice? Because he wanted to do what was right? Because he wanted to do God's will? Not at all. Felix was a scumbag. The next chapter tells us what Felix wants out of all this. In verse 25 of the next chapter, it says, And he, Paul, reasoned about righteousness and self-control in the coming judgment. Felix was alarmed and said, Go away for the present. When I get an opportunity, I will summon you. Look, at the same time, he hoped that money would be given him by Paul. So he sent for him often and conversed with him. Felix was in it for himself, just like everybody else. None of these people were motivated by doing God's will or seeking justice or even doing what was right. They were all doing what they were doing for their own selfish reasons, but the reality is still present that God is in control using them to bring about His promises. The soldiers were just following orders. The tribune just wants to save his own skin. Felix thinks he can get something out of this, but all were under the sovereign hand of God who works all things according to His will. God worked through the nephew. God worked through the non-believers. God worked through the pagan Gentiles. God worked through the hostile authorities. God worked through the governmental powers to fulfill His promise to Paul. Paul, you are going to Rome. Take courage. If God be for us, who can be against us? In this text, there aren't any commands, there aren't any exhortations, there really aren't any expositions of biblical doctrine. It's simply an account of what happened to Paul. But it shows us that God has a purpose. And He is fulfilling His plan in every aspect of our lives. He has put you here for a reason. To glorify His name, to make disciples, to grow as a disciple, to grow in relationship with Him. Our God is in control, and God knows what He is doing. Now that doesn't mean nothing bad is ever going to happen to God's people. Oh, it most assuredly will. Through many trials and tribulations, we're going to enter into the kingdom of God. That's a fact. But you can still be sure, even in those times, Paul is going to be kept in Caesarea for two years before he's moved on. We're going to see that as we walk through the day. Why? Why would you let Paul, you said you're going to send him to Rome, why let him languish at Caesarea for two years? The answer? Oh no. God knows what He's doing. You can be sure, believer, that even in the suffering that surely follows this life in this fallen world, we can rest in God's providence, in God's care, in God's hand, even when we can't see what He's doing. 
in all our circumstances, all our sufferings, all our trials, all our good times, even when sometimes things seem hopeless, by faith we can rest in the assurance that our God knows what He's doing and He promised to never leave or forsake His children. And that's all the assurance that we need. It isn't important for us to understand what He's doing or why He's doing it. The only thing we have to know is that He is in control and we can trust Him. Because if you have been united with Christ in salvation, if you've trusted Him, been indwelled by the Holy Spirit, given Him your heart and life, been united with Jesus Christ in His death and His resurrection, you're going to be walking into 2023 as a child of the King. As a bearer of the promises of God. All the promises of God in Christ are yes and amen. You're going to walk into this next year, no matter what suffering, no matter what trial, no matter what is going on in your life right now or what is to come, you're going to walk into this new year as a child of a God who is in control, who loves you with a saving love and has promised to never leave you or forsake you. You're going to walk into the new year as a bearer of the responsibility to live for your king. Psalm 56.3 says, When I am afraid, I put my trust in you, in God whose word I praise, in God I trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? And if you are not born again, you're going to walk into 2023. I guess you already have. It is 2023. You're going to walk into 2023 bearing the wrath and the condemnation of God. And there is no good that you can do that will change that fact. There's no resolution you can make. There's no promise or commitment that you can commit to that will remove the condemnation of God for your sins upon your life. Because the only thing that can do that is the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Today, on the first day of the year, Today is the day of salvation. Jesus' first words in the book of Mark, the time has come, the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. Trust in Jesus today and you will be, by the authority of God's word and the promise that he has made, you will be a child of the king, born again under his care. And the wrath of God, as we saw the last time that I was here, will never rest upon you because Jesus Christ on the cross has taken it. Give your heart and life to Him. Trust in Him today. Let's pray. Father, we do love You. We thank You for Your Word. God, we thank You for the Gospel that is so wonderful, so beautiful. God, we thank You for Your providential hand, for Your care in, in all of the things of our life. We don't know how it works out. We don't know how You accomplish Your will. God, we are just so thankful that we can rest because we have been united with Christ and all the promises that you have made for us in Christ are yes and amen. We can flip through every promise of this holy, inerrant, inspired Word of God and claim it for ourselves because Jesus bought it for us. Lord, help us to trust as we walk into this new year. Help us to walk responsibly, to walk with biblical wisdom, to follow your commands as best we know how and trust that you are in control. Lord, if there's anyone here that doesn't know you, that has been wrestling with your call upon their life to come and be saved, to have their sins washed away, God, I pray that you would, that you would move amongst their heart, that you would draw them to yourself today. God, that you would show them the cross, show them what you have done, show them the only way that their sins can be forgiven, that the wrath for sin can be taken away it's by the death and the resurrection of your Son. God, and I pray that you would give them strength, that you would give them the realization that their only option is to come to you the way, the truth, and the life, trusting that you died for them. 
Father, I pray that you would save souls today and in this new year and that you would use us for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm going to stand right down here at the front, as I always do. I would love for you to come. Love for you to, if you need to be me to pray with you or explain the gospel, the most important thing you can do today is the beginning of this year is to trust in Jesus. Give him your heart and life. And then let's walk after our King. Will you stand with me?